Wow. <laughs> thank you so very much, Rabbi Goldstein. And thank you everyone for inviting me here. That was absolutely and completely powerful. You have floored me. I don't even know if I need to continue. So I just want to say thank you for that. The human cargo was loaded on ships at a bustling wharf in the nation's capital, destined for the plantations of the Deep South. Some of the enslaved pleaded for rosaries as they were rounded up, praying for deliverance. But on this day, in the fall of 1838, no one was spared. Not the two-month-old baby or her mother. Not the field hands, not the shoemaker, and not Cornelius Hawkins, who was about 13 years old when he was forced on board. The enslaved were grandmothers and grandfathers, carpenters and blacksmiths, pregnant women and anxious fathers, children and infants who were fearful, bewildered, and despairing as they saw their families and communities ripped apart by the sale of 1838. Some children were sold without their parents. And the enslaved were dragged off by force to the ship. Others ran away before they could be captured. Their panic and their desperation would be mostly forgotten for more than a century. But this was no ordinary sale of enslaved people. The enslaved human beings had belonged to the nation's most prominent Jesuit priest, and they were sold along with scores of others to help secure the future of the premier Catholic institution of higher learning at the time, known today as Georgetown University. So what happened to these 272 men, women, and children who were literally sold down the river? And what is owed, if anything, to the descendants of those enslaved and the descendants of the millions of others whose names and circumstances we will never know, who were sold or insured or raped or castrated, lynched or subjected to gynecological experiments devoid of anesthesia. What is old, if anything, to the descendants of Africans enslaved in this country whose kidnappings and tortures and uncompensated labor helped to ensure the survival of colleges and universities and banks and corporations and industries and religious institutions and private estates and yes, the federal, state, and local governments. Thank you, Union for Reform Judaism. Deidre, thank you so very much for inviting me, Rabbis Goldstein and Pressner. Thank you for allowing me to share just a few minutes of my opening framing and excerpt, which I just presented from Professor Rachel Swan's article that was published in the New York Times in April of 2016, that chillingly described the sale of 272 enslaved persons to ensure the future of Georgetown University. And I'm pleased to have been asked to speak here today for this sacred dialogue. I just love that term, this sacred dialogue with the Jewish community as we discuss the crime against humanity that was the ma'afa of the enslavement era and its continuing vestiges against black people. But Let's not get it twisted. It was not just the South that bore culpability. My white colleague, Katrina Brown, uncovered evidence that her New England ancestors were the largest slave trading family in US history, that her ancestors brought over 10,000 Africans to the Americas in chains. She documented her roots in the Sundance uh, acclaimed film, Traces of the Trade, a story from the deep north, deep north, not the south. She stresses that the slave trade was not just a few people taking a boat and sending it out. Everyone in the New England town lived off of slavery. The boat maker, the iron worker who made the shackles, the coopers who made the barrels to hold the rum, the distillers who took the molasses and the sugar and made it into the rum. Literally, the whole town was dependent on the slave trade, wealth, wealth and privilege, wealth and privilege in the United States, Katrina says, 
has been amassed in large measure as a direct or indirect consequence of the institution of slavery. And far from being an artifact of history, slavery has a tangible presence today in the American economy and slave labor built the roads, the ports, the rail lines, which remain profit generating today. Slavery is just built into the entire American landscape, still generating wealth. Countless companies and industries benefited and were enriched from the profits made as a result of the trafficking in human beings. There are companies that sold life insurance policies on the lives of enslaved people. Aetna, New York Life, AIG, financial giants, were approved by the predecessor banks of financial giants like JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America. Others with documented ties to slavery included railroads, Norfolk Southern, CSX, Union Pacific, Canadian National, newspaper publishers that assisted in the capture of runaway persons include Knight Rider, Tribune, EW Scripps, Gannett, the financial backers of the country's top universities, including just about every Ivy League university were wealth slave owners. In the context of Black people in this country, the quest for reparations, for reparatory justice, essentially constitutes four elements. Number one, the formal acknowledgement of historical wrong and an official unfettered apology for the dehumanization and the atrocities of the enslavement era and beyond. And why do I say unfettered apology? Why don't I just say apology? Because the Senate and the House of Representatives did pass symbolic resolutions apologizing for slavery and segregation. However, the 2009 bill passed by the Senate contained a disclaimer that those seeking reparations or cash compensation could not use that apology to support a claim for reparations, the audacity. Number two, with respect to the four elements that I am proffering, the recognition that the injury has continued throughout the years and still manifests today. Number three, the commitment to redress by the federal government which sanctioned the enslavement and subsequent segregation and by state and local governments and other culpable parties which enjoyed unjust enrichment from the era. And number four, the actual compensation in whatever form or forms are agreed upon. Moreover, the United States must adhere to the five internationally accepted norms for reparations, inclusive of the requirements of number one, cessation and guarantees of non-repetition. Number two, restitution. Number three, compensation. Number four, satisfaction. Number five, rehabilitation. The spirit of reparations, my brothers and sisters, is sweeping the country. Thank you, Union for Reform Judaism, for adding your voice to the plethora of entities passing resolutions on the issue, which also include the National Council of Churches, United Church of Christ, the Diocese of the Episcopal Church, and more. The Princeton and Virginia Theological Seminaries, as well as the Jesuits, have earmarked monies. The U.S. Conference of Mayors has endorsed reparations, along with Amalgamated Bank. The Players Coalition of Professional Athletes and Coaches and Owners across leagues, <laughs> even Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream has endorsed reparations, okay? The state of California has established a reparations commission. The city of Evanston, Illinois has earmarked monies from its legal cannabis industry to fund reparation initiatives. The city of Chicago passed the reparations ordinance for victims of police torture. Jurisdictions across the country are passing laws to examine the history of the enslavement and its vestiges in their own backyards. Slavery disclosure ordinances have been enacted in 16 jurisdictions, revealing historical ties to the enslavement era from financial institutions. And just this past week, there was a historic hearing in the House of Representatives on the upcoming 100 year anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa, Oklahoma race massacre where 
107 year old living survivor, 107 years old people. Mother Viola Fletcher came to Washington DC to Congress to testify about the harm she still suffers today as a result of the obliteration of the thriving black community of Greenwood in Tulsa, also known as Black Wall Street, where black people lost everything, in addition to the very lives of over 300 black men, women, and children, but also their homes, their businesses firebombed and burned, their very livelihood snatched, dead bodies were piled up in the streets or thrown into the Arkansas River, and more than 6,000 black survivors who escaped with only the clothes on their back were confined in internment camps at the city's convention hall and fairgrounds. The insurance companies refused to pay claims on the mortgages held by Blacks because of the big lie that was perpetrated by officials in the white press characterizing the race massacre as a riot, which relieved the insurers from having to pay benefits. This one massacre alone prevented perhaps $1 billion in generational wealth, land, businesses, investments, intellectual property from being passed down. In Tulsa, Tulsa was far. It was far, far from the only massacre of Black towns. This casket is just now opening on numerous others, including Rosewood, Florida, Wilmington, North Carolina, Elaine, Arkansas, countless, countless others. We're not taught these facts in schools. I wasn't taught them. You probably weren't taught them either. We were not taught this. In fact, American history has been stripped of these atrocities. And that also, that also is part of the harm that must be addressed. There's one thing I learned from the Jewish experience. No, it was not the more than $70 billion in reparations the German government paid to more than 800,000 Holocaust survivors or the seven billion Germany agreed to give to the state of Israel. No, no. It was the concept that I heard of called transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. I never heard of it. I couldn't even pronounce it, epigenetic, whatever. But it was a study that was done of third generation Holocaust survivors where researchers found that they had inherited genes that had been transformed as a result of their ancestors' trauma and were becoming more susceptible to anxiety and other disorders. And it was found that the trauma from the Holocaust traveled in the genes transmitted intergenerationally. And I began to think, <laughs> African Americans have inherited centuries of trauma as a result, not only of the enslavement era, but also everything else. We really need to open up that casket. If the Jewish Holocaust caused immense emotional, physical, and psychological effects intense enough to cause trauma to survivors all the way down the line intergenerationally, then what is the impact on living African-Americans today? due to the abject horrors and brutality and trauma and terrorism of the enslavement era itself, the kidnappings, the forced free labor, the stealing of our languages and culture, the rapes, the breedings, the dismemberments, the brutality, the humanity, inhumanity of the black codes and convict lease labor, the peonage system, the chain gangs, the sharecropping, the lynchings, the harms of Jim Crow apartheid, denial of the benefits of the Homestead Act, the GI Bill, gerrymandering, redlining, educational inequities, health disparities, mass incarceration. And all this for 400 years, or however one wishes to measure the time, all of this still exists. It still exists within the collective genes of Black folk in this country. The harms we have suffered are multifaceted. The severities must be as well. Indeed, a reparation settlement should be fashioned in as many ways as necessary to equitably address the countless manifestations of injustice emanating from America's original sin. 
So I come to a close. We all saw the lynching of George Floyd a year ago. We all saw the January 6th, 2021 Capitol insurrection. Now we must all see this first step toward atonement, the passage of HR 40, the Federal Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals, either legislatively or via executive order as the right remedy at this time, in this day. Reparations is indeed, it is indeed an issue whose time has come. We can wait no longer. Facts, facts must no longer be dismissed, must no longer be ignored, must no longer be swept under the rug. They must be recognized. They must be acknowledged. They must be discussed and they must be redressed so as to be able to close the shameful era of US history. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Taifa. Thank you, Rabbi Goldstein. Um, Rabbi Pesner and, and I will, um, it does take a moment just for all of that history, all of that knowledge, all of that, um, all of those pieces that come together in both our Jewish, uh, I'm speechless in both um, who we are as Jews, who we are as Americans, who we are as a people. <clears throat> 